Clancy Pasta presents The Worst Family Photo, written by Sergeant Darwin and narrated by Clancy. It was the best vacation our family ever took, if you forget about the dead girl floating in the river. She's hard to forget, even after all these years. Wrapped in her puffy pink raincoat, bobbing gently up and down with the light ripples of the water, she appeared from a distance to be no older than twelve. In truth, she was sixteen. Is there much of a difference? The bridge stretched over a river of middling size. It was probably less than eighty feet high. We hadn't planned to stop and take pictures there. We were in danger of being late to the ball game. Caleb's first. We told the kids that we parked our car across the bridge, over a mile from the stadium, so that we could eat at a semi-famous burger joint in the area. In reality, we did it so we wouldn't have to pay the outrageous stadium parking fee. Regardless, with full bellies, we had just begun our walk to the park, and were totally content. Earlier in the day, when the clouds had been threatening and the air was heavy with that pre-downpour restlessness, I'd feared a rain out. Caleb would have been crushed. But the clouds had amounted to nothing more than a light drizzle, and now, the sun was beginning to poke through in places. It was a good thing, too. The damn ball game had been the whole reason to take a vacation in the first place. I suppose the story really starts two years earlier, at Caleb's Little League tryouts. Jade and I thought it was important that our kids be involved in team sports. I, growing up, hadn't been, a fact which I often felt a bit sad about. When Caleb turned nine, we arrived at baseball not out of any great love for the game, but rather a dearth of options. Caleb was too short for basketball, and Jade wouldn't hear of her boy catching brain damage on a football field. In the weeks leading up to the tryouts, I'd had my younger brother teach Caleb the basics, how to swing a bat, throw a ball. I watched the two of them practicing in the backyard from our kitchen window, having no clue whether or not the kid was any good. But he looked like he was having fun, and wasn't that what mattered? Anyway, I wasn't expecting him to be a superstar, I just hoped he wouldn't embarrass himself at tryouts. He didn't. In fact, when I picked him up that day, he seemed to think he had a shot at making the minor twos. There were three leagues for kids his age to play in, determined by talent level. The minor ones, the minor twos, and the majors. We'd anticipated, of course, that in his first year, he would play in the minor ones, the chance to move up as the years progressed. We were shocked beyond speaking the night he got the phone call from one of the league's head coaches. He'd made the majors. The coach told Caleb that he drafted him because even though our boy wasn't the biggest or most talented kid on the field, he played with heart and hustle and grit, just like a certain big league ball player. So that was how, on that overcast summer morning, we found ourselves on the bridge. I strolled along the gravelly sidewalk, fingers intertwined with jades. Caleb walked, skipped, almost, just ahead of us. A hat cocked on his head, and the name of his childhood hero stretched across the top of his back. His little sister, Abra, strode near him, struggling with the yo-yo we had bought her that morning. Everything was so picturesque and the tall trees flanking the river so beautiful that Jade stopped the family to take a photo. That was where our perfect vacation stopped being perfect. Abra whined. She hated taking pictures. The lighting's perfect right now, my dear, Jade responded patiently. And if there's one thing I hope you learn from your mother, it's that you never waste perfect lighting. She pulled the family camera from a pocket I didn't even know her jacket had, and angled it carefully on the concrete railing of the bridge, which stood less than five feet tall. In the present day, our story might have played out much differently, but when our children were young, we owned no smartphones or even digital cameras. There were no such devices to own. This family camera used rolls of film, and Jade had stocked up on those before the vacation. She'd get them all developed at Walmart's photo center when we made it back home. 
Once the camera was propped up just so, Jade set the timer and hurried over to take her place next to me in the family lineup. The picture snapped. Jade ran back to set the timer again, in case someone had blinked, of course, and rushed back once more to her family, artificially wide smiles stamped on each face. The camera snapped a second time. Moments later, a strange sound floated through the air, a cross between a splash and a dull thud. Nobody thought much of it. The sound wasn't even that noticeable above the flow of the river. Until a woman's desperate wail rang out behind us. We all whirled around at once. Some hundred yards away, partially concealed by the light rise and fall of the bridge's middle, a woman was clawing her fingernails into her face. She stared horror-struck over the edge of the bridge, a sobbing shriek on her lips, her expression utterly grotesque. I didn't know what had happened, but I knew I wanted my children far away from the situation. I gave the tickets to my wife, keeping one for myself, and told her I would meet the three of them at the stadium. For now, I said. I'll see if this woman needs help. We set off on our separate paths, but then two jigsaw pieces came together in my mind. Jade, I said. My wife turned. Don't let the kids look down there. As far as I know, the kids didn't look down there. It's a good thing, too. The sight has never left me. When I approached the hysterical woman on the bridge, an important-looking man in a smart business suit had already reached her from the other side. He was peering over the chest-high barrier, all that stood between passerby and a deadly fall. Hmm, said the man, a bit more matter-of-factly than the situation called for. Dreadful. If the woman was bothered by his aloofness, or if she even noticed it, she didn't let on. She was now sitting on the pavement, arms wrapped tightly around her knees, rocking back and forth and sobbing and repeating the word, Natalie, over and over. Blood speckled her cheeks from where she had scratched herself. The man pulled from beneath his suit coat pocket a cellular phone which, impressive though it was at the time, would have been considered comically huge just five years later. He pressed three digits on it and began to speak to the emergency operator, his voice carrying over the sobs of the woman near my feet. I remember thinking, with some righteousness, that I just couldn't see the appeal in a cellular phone. Imagine people being able to get a hold of you whenever they wanted. I closed my eyes. Knowing full well what I'd see, I opened them seconds later and allowed myself to glance over the ledge. Sure enough, a young girl lay dead below, bobbing lightly up and down with a movement of the water. She lay in a pocket of water surrounded by tall plants, which was reasonably still and quite shallow. This pocket seemed to be the only reason she hadn't been swept downstream. What's more, it may well have been the reason she died. Had she landed in deeper, moving water, she might have survived the fall. She looked, as I said when the story began, no older than twelve. She wore a puffy pink raincoat that seemed to be too small and juvenile for her, as though it was bought for a girl much younger than she. Because despite appearances, the girl below me whose name was presumably Natalie was actually a junior in high school, or at least she had been. The girl's blonde hair spread out like a fan from her head, and a ray of sunlight escaped the clouds above, giving her a vaguely angelic look. Or perhaps that was my imagination. Regardless, as I stood there unable to look away, listening without hearing to the man next to me as he spoke his final words to the emergency operator, I realized something. Young Natalie had the misfortune of being the first dead body I'd ever seen in my life. Neither I nor the cell phone bearing businessman made an effort to console the woman near us or even approach her in conversation. She was now lying in the fetal position and trembling slightly, 
an occasional whimper sliding between her lips. The spots of blood from her cheeks were now smeared across her face, making the whole sorry scene look more criminal than it should have. We both hovered nearby, knowing the police would wish to speak with us, feeling like intruders on this woman's grief. A few minutes later, the woman was no longer crying. It seemed like she'd cried herself out, in fact. But her whimpers had turned to wails, and she clutched and pulled at the fabric of her blouse so hard, I thought it might rip. I had a flashback of my childhood, reading Bible stories with my parents, stories about men like Job and David who were so overcome with grief that they ripped their own garments into pieces. Such an extravagant display of anguish seemed a little unrealistic to me at the time, but in the presence of this woman, it was those passages which came to mind. After what seemed an eternity, a single police officer arrived. This seemed negligent to me. Granted, I came from a much smaller city, with a much less busy police force, but still. The image of the girl named Natalie floating below seemed disturbing enough to warrant at least a second lawman. The young officer, who was clearly overwhelmed by the situation, had the bad sense to begin speaking with all three of us at the same time. The man in the suit introduced himself as an employee of what I gathered was a rather impressive firm downtown, and he did so with such aplomb that the police officer seemed to think this man, and not he, was in charge. I was standing over there, near the main road, the man said, pointing from whence he had come. When I heard a scream, this woman's scream. He nodded to the woman, now on her hands and knees, moaning lowly and seemingly unaware of her surroundings. She was staring over the edge of the bridge. I looked over myself as I hurried towards her, and saw the young girl's body lying below. Good, good, said the police officer. He seemed deeply distracted by the almost inhuman noises coming from the woman at our feet, emanating from her at random intervals. He turned to me. And you? I told him my story. Then the officer crouched down and, with more authority and grace than he had heretofore demonstrated, began to address the woman. Ma'am, my name is Officer Morris. I'm here to help you. Do you think you could answer just a couple questions for me? Slowly, the woman looked up at him and nodded. The blood on her face had crusted, and her expression was grotesque. I began to wonder what my face would look like if my entire life had been flipped upside down in a mere moment. Who is the girl, ma'am? My. The woman hiccuped loudly. She's my daughter, Natalie. She's 16. And could you tell me what happened, ma'am? In your own words? My mind, as minds are known to do, latched onto a wholly unimportant detail. The phrase, in your own words, used purely out of ceremony as if the woman could have spoken someone else's words, and almost forgot to listen to the far more interesting things being said. I... I could. The woman took a deep breath, and then told her story with no sobs, no hiccups, no interruptions to speak of. Natalie was very, very sick. The doctors weren't totally sure what was wrong with her. They thought it was a bad bout of food poisoning at first, but it just wouldn't go away. Days turned to weeks, weeks turned into months. She could hardly keep any food down, and she was constantly achy and nauseous and pale. I took her out of school for most of April and May. Anyway, that's the whole reason we were out here. She was feeling a little better today, or so she told me. When the rain stopped and the sun started to shine through the clouds, she begged me to let her go outside. It was her favorite kind of weather. So she and I got dressed and went out here for a walk. We were planning on going to one of the parks down by the frontage road. And that's how... 
The woman took a deep breath. She sounded as though something large were caught in her throat. And that's how we ended up here, on the bridge, she said. We were walking together, side by side. She fell behind just a few steps. I didn't notice. I don't think she wanted me to notice. The next thing I knew, she was over the edge. She... She jumped. Officer Morris nodded. You saw her jump? No, thank God. I heard her land down there, in the river. I turned around to look over the edge, and that's when... When I saw her. The woman's voice wavered, and tears filled her eyes once more. And before hardly a moment had passed, she was a puddle of hysterics again. Officer Morris looked resigned. There would be no more answers from her, at least not for a while. He turned to us. Gentlemen, write your contact information down on this paper and then you can go. I did. As I handed the paper back to Officer Morris, he said, Enjoy the game. I did. It's amazing what a person can put out of their mind if they need to. I had just witnessed the most disturbing scene of my life, and not an hour later was at a baseball game with my family. The game was surprisingly wonderful. I'd always thought of baseball as boring, but actually being in the stadium, as opposed to watching on TV, was an enormous improvement. What's more, Caleb's favorite player made up for his poor first at-bats with a go-ahead double in the eighth inning. When he slid into second base head first, a pure demonstration of the hustle he was known for, I thought Caleb might actually faint with joy. Like I said, it was the best vacation our family ever took, if you can forget about Natalie. And for a few weeks, nobody had much problem forgetting about Natalie. Nobody but me had seen the body. Caleb and Abra didn't even know there had been a body. As far as we knew, they didn't know anything had happened at all. I suppose that's why it was such a shock, one night a few weeks after the vacation, when Abra knocked on our bedroom door and said, Mom? Dad? Natalie says you should look closer. We glanced at each other, not connecting the dots at first. Jade walked over to open the bedroom door. What, sweetie? She said, crouching down to meet our daughter's gaze. At the picture, Abra said. Natalie wanted me to tell you to look closer at it. What Abra didn't know, what she couldn't possibly know, was that earlier in the day, Jade had the pictures from our vacation developed. I had come home from work for a long lunch, and Jade and I spent the hour flipping through the pictures together, laughing and reminiscing. It was great fun, until we got to the pictures on the bridge. There were only two of them, the first take and the second. In the first, our family was standing together on the bridge, smiling brightly. In the second, taken in case any of us had blinked or made a face in the first, nobody had, our family stood and smiled just the same as before. Only one detail was different. In the background of the second picture, on the farthest edge of the photograph, a blonde-haired girl in a puffy pink raincoat could be seen in mid-flight, falling from the bridge. I saw Natalie first. Feeling me tense up, perhaps hearing my light intake of breath, Jade turned to me. What's wrong, hon? She asked. Awestruck, I found myself unable to speak. To articulate, I simply pointed at the picture. Jade looked down. What are you... Oh. Oh my god. Oh my god. A small scream escaped her lips. That... She's... Jade turned her face away. Nope, nope. I can't look at it. Throw it away. I didn't need to be told twice. 
I snatched up the photograph, strode to our kitchen, opened the cupboard below the sink, and threw it in the garbage can. No, I... Jade began. Not there. I need it out of the house. It's vile, she shuddered. At first, I wasn't sure why she had reacted so strongly. But then, I realized. Jade hadn't really experienced much of anything that day on the bridge. She hadn't spent half an hour with a grief-addled mother. She hadn't seen Natalie's corpse bobbing in the water, hair floating outward like an ornate crown. She had largely escaped the situation, and I had only given her the barest details. She never asked for more. Jade sat on the couch, legs curled up to her chest, looking thoroughly disturbed. I knew at that moment that she was picturing her own children launching themselves headfirst over the bridge. The kitchen garbage can was good enough for me, but if Jade wanted it out of the house, then out of the house it would go. All right, I said, picking the photo back out of the garbage can and taking it out the garage door. I walked around to the side of our house where the big outdoor garbage buckets were. I took out the top garbage bag, threw the picture in, and put the bag down on top of it. Before I did though, I snuck one last quick look at the young girl, her arms outstretched, her hair billowing around her, the sun glimmering off it as she fell to her early death. Jade had been right. The lighting was perfect. Jade turned her gaze from Abra and looked at me furious. I thought I told you to get it out of the house, she said. I... I did, I said, nonplussed. I buried it deep in the outside can. Not deep enough, apparently, she said. Don't fight, said Abra. I didn't look at it. I don't want to. Jade and I looked back at our daughter. I just want you to look at it. Well, Natalie does. She says you didn't look close enough. We were silent for a few moments, then I managed. What do you mean, Natalie says? Abra rolled her eyes. She was at that age, giving attitude to her parents constantly, but still too young for it to be anything other than cute. I mean, she said, inflecting her words as though she were the one speaking to a six-year-old. Natalie says, I don't know why. It's just what she said. What are you talking about? Jade stammered. Who's Natalie, sweetie? When did she say this to you? Just now, Abra said. Then, sensing we needed more explanation, she added, She's in my bedroom. I'd never moved so fast in my life. In two strides, I was past my wife and daughter, and two more, halfway to Abra's bedroom. Not even pausing to think about what I'd find, I flung open her door and stepped inside. Nothing. There was nobody there. Of course there's nobody here, I thought. What the hell are you thinking? Jade and Abra were right behind me. This time, it was Abra's turn to look nonplussed. Natalie? Abra called. Natalie? She sighed angrily. God, she was here a minute ago. Don't say God, Jade said feebly. I think she was desperate for some sense of normalcy to invade the conversation. Some people don't like it. You say it. Abra accused. I know, sweetie. Grown-ups... I interrupted. Abra, where did Natalie come from? What does she look like? I don't know. She looked normal, Abra said, shrugging. She just knocked on the door and I let her in. The door to the house? No, the door to my room. I don't open the door to the house. You told me not to, remember? 
Yes, of course we remember, I said, glancing back nervously at her bedroom door. That's good, sweetie. Good for you. But when you say she looked normal, like, how old was she? What color was her hair? Yellow, Abra said promptly. I don't know how old she was. Older than Caleb. But younger than me and mom? Yeah, she said. Then, with a bit more attitude. Why are you guys freaking out so much? She was nice. Jade looked at me helplessly, terrified. What the fuck, she mouthed. I shrugged. I didn't know what to say, to either of them. Abra broke the silence, grumbling. Fine, don't answer me then. Uh, sweetie, it's sort of complicated, Jade said. Why? Opera demanded. Listen, Mom. She came in and sat right there. Opera pointed at the bed. She was really nice to me. She said I reminded her of her little sister. She said that her sister's name was Eliza. She said that she missed Eliza. And she said that I needed to tell you to look closer at the picture. I asked her what picture and she wouldn't tell me. She just said it was really important that I told you to look closer. She made me promise, so then I came and told you, and I don't know where she went. She glared at her mother fiercely, as though wondering what could possibly be the least bit complicated about that. Okay. Thanks, sweetie. Jade said softly. I'll stay with you, and I guess... I... Guess your daddy will go take a closer look at that picture? Uh... I shrugged, feeling more out of my depth than I had perhaps ever felt in my life. Sure, yeah, I guess. You don't want to come with? I can't look at it again, Jade said, lightly pressing our daughter's head to her bosom. That poor woman reaching out like that. I'll never get it out of my mind as is. Well, what am I looking for? Jade shrugged. I was already to the garage by the time the strangeness of her remark struck me. Woman? Reaching out? I opened the lid of the garbage can and pulled the top bag out. There below it, a bit damp, was the photograph. I picked it up. It was already dark outside, but the motion sensor on the side of our house had triggered, and one of the outdoor lights turned on. Huddling under it, holding the picture near the bulb, I did as my daughter told me to, and looked closer. I saw immediately what Jade had been talking about, but it was easy to see how I'd missed it. On the far side of the shot, next to where the girl's falling body was, were the outstretched arms of Natalie's mother. Most of her body and about half of her face was covered by Caleb and his cocked up ball cap. But she was there, behind our family, watching helplessly as her own family crumbled. Her outward gesture was desperate. I understood why Jade couldn't look at the photo again. Perhaps no mother could help replacing that billowing golden hair with the hair of her own child, those outstretched arms with her own. God, what a thing, I thought to myself, and our family had gotten wrapped up in the middle of it somehow. The light went off, leaving me with only the glow of the moon to see by. I waved my arm around, and the light turned back on. My thoughts all seemed to be pounding on my skull at once, demanding to be heard, each claiming their utmost importance. Thus, I found myself unable to give full attention to any of them, but beneath them all was the vague idea that I was missing something. How on earth had Abra even known about the picture? About the girl named Natalie? Perhaps she had looked down after all, that day on the bridge? Still, it wouldn't explain how she knew the girl's name. 
And there was something else, too. Something in the back of my mind, but getting closer to the front, that didn't quite add up. And Abra had seemed so totally convinced that a girl named Natalie had actually been in her room. Was I willing to seriously entertain that possibility? No, no, I frantically told myself. There were plenty of explanations that made sense. I didn't need to start telling myself ghost stories. But what other explanations make sense, huh? Name one, just one. Something's wrong. Something's wrong here, and you know it. But what was wrong? How could I know what was wrong when I couldn't even form a coherent thought? Even the most preposterous explanations didn't make sense. Suppose, after all, that Natalie's ghost really had visited my daughter. All for the purpose of... What? Getting me to take a closer look at this photograph? I turned it over in my hands. Examined the front, the back. I'd learned nothing new on second glance. Nothing at all, except... Natalie was very, very sick. It all came in an instant. She begged me to let her go outside. It was her favorite kind of weather. My mind flashed back to that day on the bridge. She fell behind just a few steps. I didn't notice. I was right. Something was very wrong. The next thing I knew, she was over the edge. She... She jumped. And what had Officer Morris asked Natalie's mother? You saw her jump? And shaking, I looked once more at the photo, which now seemed more vile than I, or Jade, had ever realized. No, thank God. I heard her land down there, in the river. I turned around to look over the edge, and that's when... When I saw her. The difference was subtle, but obvious once noticed. The positioning of the wrists, the hands, the arms of Natalie's mother were not outstretched, as they had first seemed, in a desperate attempt to catch her child. And though only part of her face was visible, it was clear. Natalie's mother did not wear a shocked expression, not horrified not grief-stricken. I've never seen another face quite like it, to be honest. And I doubt you have either. Unless you've borne witness to a woman murdering her own daughter. Detective Nato closed her eyes and sighed. We've suspected. We've looked into it, but there was no proof. None at all. And, you know, a grieving mother... It's not the kind of accusation you want to bring up unless you've actually got something. I didn't know what to say. I remained quiet, trying to stop my foot tapping on the tile floor. The door to Detective Nato's office was closed, but all the sounds of a bustling workplace behind us were still clearly audible. I only wish... well, not that it would have helped. What? I asked. Natalie had a younger sister, Eliza. I tried to look like I hadn't already known this information. The detective continued. She died of a bad flu years before, when she was just a little girl. There was no need to feign surprise here. Aubra's words rang in my head. She said that she missed Eliza. I should say, it looked like a bad flu, at least. Now, well, it seems doubtful, doesn't it? She said this more to herself than to me. We were both silent for a long while, then she cleared her throat, shook her head lightly, 
and took on the same business-like air she'd had when I first stepped into her office. Thank you so much for bringing this to our attention, she said. The picture by itself doesn't prove that she threw Natalie over, of course. But you're correct. It completely contradicts her testimony. Both testimonies, in fact. She was questioned again by a detective the next day. It probably won't be enough for a conviction, but it should be enough to stop. Her voice trailed off. She cleared her throat again, then said, Again, thank you. Do you have any questions for me? I had a million questions, most of them revolving around the fact that it seemed for all the world like an actual ghost had visited my daughter, but I kept those to myself. I shook my head. Detective Nato stood up, staring at the photograph in her hand. It's lucky you noticed this. You're right, it's not obvious on first glance. And the chances of you even taking this picture in the first place. I know, I said. It's crazy. I didn't bother to tell her that my wife's good timing had been just about the least crazy detail of our entire story. Crazy doesn't begin to cover it, the detective said. She looked down at the floor as though trying to decide something, then lowered her voice and said, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but this woman is currently trying to file for adoption. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. I want to give a huge thanks to all of my supporters over at Patreon and YouTube memberships. Your support makes these narrations possible, and I appreciate it a ton. If you'd like to join these lovely ghouls, you can head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash clancypasta, or click the join button below to become a member. Through Patreon, you can gain access to extra videos, on-screen thanks in the end credits of every video, personal shoutouts and a special video once a month, autographed stickers, merch store discounts, exclusive Discord roles, and much, much more. And if you'd like creepy cool shirts, make sure to head on over and check out my official merch store, creepycoolshirts.com, for some awesome tees, hoodies, stickers, and more. Alright, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great night. Cheers.